Good morning, good afternoon, and good evening, everyone. And welcome to this Inside Scientific webinar titled Novel Animal Models and Methods for Studying COVID-19, Golden Hamsters, and Aerosolized SARS-CoV-2 Delivery. I'm Liam Sanyo from the events team here at scientist.com, and I'll be your host today. This webinar has been sponsored by Harvard Bioscience and DSI, so big thanks to them for helping to make this webinar possible. We're very fortunate to have Dr. Valeria Fumagalli and Dr. Nancy Kwasi here, who will present two novel animal models of COVID-19 and highlight recent research conducted using these models. And without any further ado, I'm very pleased to welcome the first speaker, Dr. Valeria Fumagalli. Valeria, thanks so much for joining us today. And the floor is yours whenever you're ready. Thank you very much. Good morning, afternoon, and evening, everybody. I would like to thank the organizer for giving me this opportunity to present here in this webinar. And today we'll speak about a paper that we recently published on science immunology that is about the administration of aerosolized SARS-CoV-2 to K18 human transgenic mice that uncouples respiratory infection from fatal neuroinvasion. First of all, I would like to thank my group uh, and particularly my colleagues uh, uh, Pietro, Nicole and David that work with me in the BSL3 facility. Uh, for, of course, my mentor Matteo Iannacone and Luca Guidotti, foundings and all our collaborators. Without them, uh, we could not perform this kind of experiment. Moving from, for, to science, you know that uh, the, uh, major, the most widely used uh, transgenic mouse model for SARS-CoV-2 pathogenesis, the K18 human is 2 whereby um, the human is 2 is, is um, expressed under the cytokeratin 18 promoter. And these mice under deep anesthesia are internally instilled with a liquid suspension of SARS-CoV-2. And we observed uh, as others that uh, uh, these mice experience body weight loss uh, during time uh, increase in the clinical scores and so in uh, severe disease and uh, up to 80 percent of the mice died uh, up to six days post infection and the remaining one were very lethargic and we observed that this uh, uh, severe disease was mainly due to infection in the brain indeed we were able to spot uh, um, sars 2 rna both three days and six days post infection in the brain of internally infected mice we confirmed the data by immunofluorescent staining of the nucleocapsid of the nucleoprotein of sars 2 and we can observe that uh, almost all the neurons uh, are infected by sars 2 and also, we were able to find the SARS-CoV-2 RNA in the olfactory bulb of the mice, both three and six day post-infection, uh, olfactory bulb that are the center of the olfactory sensory neurons. So uh, we can conclude from this data that intranasal inoculation of SARS-CoV-2 leads to fatal neuroinvasion in uh, uh, K18 human is 2 transgenic mice. And so all the clinical signs of the disease that, that we observe are mainly due to brain involvement rather than lung pathology. Indeed, uh, this is not a uh, uh, well model to study SARS-CoV-2 pathogenesis because uh, um, fatal encephalitis rarely occurs in uh, uh, patients with COVID-19. And uh, this uh, limits the usefulness of these mouse models, hampering study on disease pathogenesis like long-term consequences of the disease or drug discovery and tests of antiviral and, and, and vaccine. For this reason, uh, our lab decided to develop a novel model, a novel platform to study SARS-CoV-2 pathogenesis, taking advantage of the resolution of SARS-CoV-2 in order to mimic what happened in the human-to-human -human transmission. For this reason, we take advantage of uh, not only an initial tower system that we obtain from Data Science International, and we are able to nebulize the virus uh, inside this nebulizer, nebulizer head, and uh, the hydrosolized virus reach only the nose of the mice, that in this case are not anesthetized. And, uh, uh, Thanks to this model, we are also able to uh, control the pressure inside the tower that, and the temporary humidity that are parameters very important to define uh, the, uh, part, the dimension and the size of the uh, particle aerosolized. So uh, we set uh, we set uh, a protocol whereby we are able to nebulize 10 to the 5 to 50 per mouse in 125 microliters, exposing mice uh, up to 30-40 minutes. 
And what you observe, we compare the series of infection. In red, we can see the aerosol exposed mice, and in blue, the intranasal infected mice. And we can see that differently from intranasal infection, the aerosol exposed mice uh, do not experience body weight loss, and neither uh, clinical score of the exo, neither sign of disease, and neither mortality. Indeed, we uh, did not find any trace, uh, trace of uh, viral RNA in the brain uh, of these mice, both at the three days and six days post-infection, compared to the intranasal infected mice. However, uh, viral RNA in the lung uh, were comparable between the two of infection, meaning that uh, we are able to uh, infect efficiently uh, with aerosol exposure uh, uh, the lung of the creatine humanist to mice uh, without having a fatal neuroinvasion. Next, uh, we uh, were interested to evaluate what happened in the upper respiratory tract. So we evaluated in the nose, and in particular, the nasal turbinate of these mice. And we were able to detect viral RNA both upon intranasal infection and aerosol exposure, even if uh, at lower strength. But since we were able to find RNA, uh, viral RNA in these mice, we were interested also in evaluating if these mice were anosmic, since anosmia is one of the uh, major clinical signs observed in humans. So we perform uh, a social cell discrimination assay, whereby male uh, KT in human transgenic mice uh, were exposed to a female bedding or a male bedding inside a cage. In a normal condition, so PBS treated mice, um, they, they should spend more time in sniffing uh, the female bedding as a, as a um, monitor here evaluating the sniffing time. However, if mice are anosmic, they should spend less time in sniffing female bedding. Indeed, both upon intranasal infection and aerosol exposure, in particular three day post infection, we have a reduction in the time spent in sniffing female bedding, meaning that these mice are anosmic. This was also true of six day post infection upon aerosol exposure. We were not able to perform this kind of assay uh, upon intranasal infection because mice were very lethargic. This uh, is very interesting because we were not able to find neither in the brain, but also in the olfactory bulb, where I said before are present the olfactory sensory neuron, presence of the virus upon aerosol exposure. So uh, we found that aerosol exposure to SARS-CoV-2 leads to anosmia in the absence of central nervous system infection. And how this can be possible? We are trying to investigate in this and to, to understand which is the mechanism. And we perform uh, first uh, preliminary experiment uh, where we uh, perform immunostochemistry analysis uh, by staining for nucleocapsid protein on SARS-CoV-2, uh, the olfactory bulb where are present olfactory sensory neuron. And we can see in the upper part of the slide, the intranasal infection uh, we have upon intranasal infection, we have that all the neurons are infected, while upon aerosol exposure, as already observed by uh, the level of RNA, we do not have the presence of the virus. But interesting, in the olfactory epithelium, where we have uh, the olfactory sensory neuron, but also uh, cells that are important to sustain the survival of the olfactory sensory neuron, that are two tentacular cells or Bowman gland, we have that uh, upon intranasal infection, um, a positivity for SARS-CoV-2, both uh, in, the, in the olfactory sensory neuron and in these cells that are structural cells. However, upon aerosol exposure, we have the presence of the virus only in Bowman gland. So uh, we are now interested in evaluating how um, the uh, infection of the Bowman gland can affect then the sense of smells leading to anosmia. So this one uh, is, this is one of the uh, um, study that we are performing now, but we are also interested in studying the immune response upon SARS-CoV-2. And in particular, uh, we are interested in studying the immune response upon uh, antiviral treatment to SARS-CoV-2. So we decided to take advantage of, a novel, of an hour uh, novel um, div, um, route of infection, that is the aerosolization of the SARS-CoV-2, and to test uh, antiviral treatment, to evaluate if the antiviral can affect the immune response to SARS-CoV-2. So uh, we take advantage of a protease inhibitor that is an orally available drug uh, already approved, and we typically are not uh, creating humanist to mice um, after the infection with, uh, SARS with SARS-CoV-2 upon aerosol exposure. And we uh, treated mice two times per day by oral gavage, and we evaluate a six, seven day post-infection in the peripheral blood, the immune response. These experiments are still ongoing, so the results are very preliminary. 
And uh, we observed that uh, in red, we have mice treated with antiviral drug and in blue, the mice treated with the vehicle, both infected with SARS-CoV-2. We have here, um, in, the, in the first panel uh, at the bottom of the slide, we can see the level of uh, um, immunoglobulins in the plasma that are immunoglobulin specific for the RBD of SARS-CoV-2. And we have a reduction in the uh, presence of these IgG in the antiviral treated mice. And also, we have a reduction in the uh, antiviral response from CD8 T cells because upon resimulation in vitro, we have uh, less uh, interferon, TNF, and granzyme production. This suggests that the immune response is reduced upon antiviral treatment. And now we are interested in evaluating what happened upon reinfection, if uh, antiviral treated mice uh, uh, have the possibility to generate a memory response and so are protected to uh, a re-challenge of the virus. And this was an example that we use. Uh, uh, I, I would like to give you an example how we use our uh, um, route of infection to study SARS-CoV-2 pathogenesis. So, to conclude, uh, we have compared two different uh, routes of infection, the intranasal inoculation of SARS-CoV-2, that is the widely used, but uh, uh, lead to a clinical picture of encephalitis, pneumonia, but results in death after six, five days post-infection, limiting the usefulness of this uh, uh, model. On the other hand, we develop uh, a new um, a new platform that is the aerosolization of SARS-CoV-2 with the uh, nozzle inhalation tower system that lead to a robust uh, respiratory infection, anosmia, lung inflammation, fever in deposition, but not fatal neuroinvasion, meaning that the whole the clinical parameter that we are describing are mainly due to lung infection rather than uh, um, neuroinvasion as observed upon intranasal inoculation. And as very last slide, I would like to show you that uh, Couple, we would like to couple the, this uh, route of infection with new mouse models since you know that creatinine human is two mice is not a very good model uh, because the human is two is under the cytokeratin 18 promoter so is widely expressed and with a not physiological expression. So we, perf we develop an hybrid is two transgenic mice where only the exon two and exon three of the murine is two are replaced with the human exon two and exon three because in these two hexons uh, were found to be the amino acid specific to bind uh, SARS-CoV-2. And uh, we um, evaluated that these mice efficiently uh, are infected upon aerosol exposure to SARS-CoV-2, both in the lung, in the nasal turbinate, uh, and not in the brain as expected. On the other hand, uh, since we are interested in the immune response, uh, we decided also to develop a BCR transgenic mouse that express all the B cells with BCR specific for the RBD of SARS-CoV-2. Uh, because we are interested to uh, isolate B cells from these mice, transfer them in uh, KT human transgenic mice uh, that lack uh, the uh, endogenous antibody production, infect the mice and see what happens in order to characterize the uh, humoral immune response. And uh, I would like to thank you for uh, to be here and for the attention and I open to question at the end. Fantastic. Well, thanks so much, Valeria, for a great presentation. And now I'm pleased to welcome Dr. Nancy Kwasi to the virtual stage. Nancy, thanks so much for joining us and feel free to take it away whenever you're ready. Hi. Um... Good morning, good evening, everyone of my side, and thank you for, organ for the organizer for uh, the, to give me an opportunity to speak here today. Uh, yes, my pleasure to present some insight in our work on zask of two pathogenesis in high risk group and all the lessons we learned from influenza. Uh, in our group, we investigate the impact and trans transmissibility of zoonotic virus like influenza on different high risk groups, for example, asthmatic patients, uh, obese people, or also pregnant women and, and, child and children. Uh, we identify uh, pathomechanism in humans that could, for example, uh, mediate increased severity and study this mechanism uh, using different animal models like mice, guinea pigs, ferrets, and hamster in our BSL2 uh, or BSL3 uh, lab. As a next step, we then translate our findings back from the animal to your human cohort. Um, it's known that sex, age, and also gender have an impact on incidence and severity of several infection disease. In fact, 
uh, female in reproductive age are more likely to be hospitalized, but also to develop CV influenza infection than male. Uh, in our lab, we could confirm that a female were more likely to die upon avian H7 and 9 and also H5 and 1 influenza A virus infection than male. Furthermore, we could also show a protective effect of testosterone during an infection with uh, the 2009 pandemic influenza virus in female mice. Although all these data take that take, uh, taken together show the importance of sex hormone in uh, infection disease. Uh, in 2019, when the COVID-19 pandemic hits the world, we decided as a whole group to switch our focus from, uh, from influenza to SARS-CoV-2 and use all our knowledge from, the, from influenza infection in this new zoonotic virus. Uh, it appeared more and more clear in the last decade that sex hormones are able to regulate the whole cell immunity and act far beyond reproduction. In fact, uh, intracellular and also cell surface mediated sex hormone receptor may, upon activation, affect the cell to cell signaling, but also systemic hormone signaling pathway via the blood systems. Uh, moreover, during the last decades, evidence grew that sex hormone play an important role in lung health. Sex bias and differences are known in various lung diseases, such as asthma, for example, COPD, and also pulmonary fibrosis, for example, highlighting once again uh, how important the impact of sex hormone on immunity and also lung health. Uh, in order to study SARS-CoV-2 pathogenicity and also the effect of SARS-CoV-2 infection on sex hormone metabolism, we established in our uh, lab a golden hamster model that mimic the key fate features of SARS-CoV-2 pathogenesis observed in COVID-19 patients. Um, therefore, we infected the male and female golden hamster with the same uh, virus dose using a moderate uh, COVID-19 model, and we monitor body weight and lung function over the time. Uh, we could observe that during the first um, six days uh, after infection in, during the acute phase, um, the weight loss was comparable between the male and the female. However, um, during the recovery phase from day seven to day 14 after infection, the infected male recovered more <clears throat> slowly compared to females. In fact, on day 14 uh, post-infection, the infected male uh, still show reduced body weight compared to females. Um, this delay in recovery in male was also associated with increased uh, fibrosis formation in the lung of the male compared to the female after the ask of uh, infection compared to the uh, control um, treated uh, hamster. Uh, next, we want to assess if this observed delay in the recovery in the male hamster was associated with impaired lung function. Uh, therefore, we uh, measure uh, longitudinally respiratory function of SARS-CoV-2 infected male and female on the uh, 0, 6, 14, and 21 post-infection using um, a small animal whole body plethysmography from uh, DSI. Uh, we have six red chamber here in our base uh, free lab that we use for the measurement. We measure the lung function in hamster for 10 minutes with uh, that adaptation times for 30, 20 minutes for females and 30 minutes for males. Um, now to the results. We observed that uh, the respiratory function was more severely impaired in, in infected male compared to female on the sixth post infection. In both sex, we could observe that the tidal volume was reduced on the uh, six day post infection, with which persists until day 14 post infection in, um, uh, in male uh, hamster. Male hamster compensate this deficit in, um, in the tidal volume with high breathing frequency, uh, resulting in a normal, normal ventilator rate, ventilation rate. In comparison, the breathing frequency uh, stay normal in female hamster that show a uh, similar reduced tidal volume as male. But interestingly, in line with uh, previous data on restrictive lung disease, 
the uh, the uh, the mid tidal expiratory flow EF50 was enhanced in male hamster, but not in female. And this data highlighting the increased disease severity uh, observed in male hamster compared to female hamster. Um, in line with the previous data, uh, infected male hamster show a re uh, reduction in the peak inspiratory flow and increase expiratory flow. The female hamster just uh, show and reduce uh, expiratory flow by the normal expiratory flow. As all uh, taken together, this data show that a male hamster presents an impaired lung function after the SARS-CoV-2 infection compared to females. Uh, we then go further and want to ask, assess if the SARS-CoV-2 infection can have an impact on sex hormones metabolism. Uh, therefore, we quantified testosterone and also estrogen level in the plasma of uh, male and female hamster at a uh, various um, time point after infection. Uh, we could see that in infected uh, male hamster, the testosterone level dropped three day post infection compared to the level prior uh, to infection. And also the testosterone uh, level start to recover on the six post infection and was fully recovered on the 14 uh, uh, post infection compared to the control uh, hamster. Uh, we could also observe that the lowest uh, plasma testosterone level detected on uh, day three post infection correlated with the highest uh, virus titer in the lung of the SARS CoV 2 uh, infected male hamster. In contrast, we could observe that the infected male hamster show an increased estrogen level on the free post infection, and this highest uh, estrogen level was also associated with the peak uh, virus titer in the lung free day post infection. Uh, we conclude that the, the observed impaired lung function correlates with a low testosterone and high estrogen level in male hamster. Uh, in female, the picture is a little bit uh, different. Um, in infected female males, uh, sorry, in infected female hamster, no significant alteration in uh, plasma tes uh, testosterone level was detected, uh, in line with the very low level of testosterone in young female hamster in general, like in human. But we could also detect very high um, Long tighter, uh, tighter, three day post infection in female comparable to the uh, detected uh, titer in uh, tighter in the male. The the estradiol level, however, was uh, reduced after the SARS-CoV-2 infection in infected uh, female hamster compared to the PBS group. And uh, we taken together the virus titer were negatively associated with the estradiol level. Uh, particularly on the free uh, post infection in female hamster. We could conclude that in female hamster, the impaired lung function correlates with the low estrogen level. Um, CIP, uh, CIP 91, as known as aromatase, uh, was identified as a major sex hormone metaboli metabolizing enzyme that converts testosterone to estradiol. And the CYP90A1 gene contains predicted binding sites for key um, transcriptive factors such as for cytokines and use NF-kappa-B, for example, state one, state three, four, six, and many others. Um, this um, highlights the critical role from CYP90A1 in sex-specific specific immunity. In order to um, study uh, causalities as, as well as our molecular mechanism, we assess if the golden hamster uh, model could provide a suitable model uh, to study the role of CYP90E1 in SARS-CoV-2 pathogenesis. Therefore, first we assess the CYP90E1 protein expression level in uninfected male and female hamster. And here we uh, detect an increase CYP90E1 Protein expression in the in the male lung compared to the female lung. Uh, after infection uh, in uh, SARS-CoV-2 infected male hamster, the CYP the CYP19A1 expression increased, 
compare to the control hamster, but also compare uh, to the female hamster. Um, we next uh, want to understand if um, the CYP90A1 dysregulation that we observed before in the lung of hamster is dependent on the complex in vitro, in vivo settings in hamster, or if this dysregulation can be also be uh, um, shown in vitro, for example. Therefore, we infected human lung cells, the calorie cells, with ASCOV2, and as a control, we infected the cells with uh, SARS-CoV or H1N1 influenza A virus. Uh, here we could uh, detect um, uh, CYP90A1 mRNA, uh, mRNA exp uh, expression um, induction in SARS-CoV-2 infected cells, but not in SARS-CoV uh, cells and also not in H1N1 um, influenza virus infected lung cells. Uh, this uh, these data show that SARS-CoV-2 has evolved a specific mechanism not observed in these ancestor, the SARS-CoV viruses, and also not in, a, uh, in other respiratory pathogen to dysregulate the CYP90A1 uh, in the lung, for example. Um, as next step, we want to understand if the CYP90A1 can actually um, causally um, act on the overall impaired lung health from hamster. Therefore, we infected a um, uh, female and male hamster with SARS-CoV-2 and uh, treated the hamster with the clinical the clinically approved CYP19A1 inhibitor letrozole. And uh, we monitor body weight and lung function all the time. First of all, we assessed uh, if the CYP90A1 treatment can improve the recovery after the SARS-CoV-2 infection, and we could observe uh, an increased weight gain uh, of letrozole treated uh, male compared to uh, placebo male on the 21 post-infection, and this weight was similar to uh, the placebo treated uh, male hamster. In contrast, uh, female did not uh, benefit from the letrozole treatment. Uh, we then uh, want to know if the treatment uh, may also res uh, result to improve lung function in the of 2 infected male and female hamster after infection. Um, we uh, measure the lung function of the male and female hamster after infection, and here we can uh, observe that in male infected with of 2 the letrozole treatment results in fast recovery in the tidal volume uh, uh, from the six and also attain the level of a placebo group on the 21 post-infection. Uh, uh, accordingly to the, um, this data, we also uh, see um, and the, that the brief frequency shown accelerate um, normalization in the literature treated animals comparable to the placebo treated animal on the 21 post-infection. However, no major improvement could be observed in the female hamster. We then assess other parameters in the lung function and uh, <clears throat> in line with the uh, improved breathing frequency and also the tidal volume, the letrozole treated male show improved inspiratory time, uh, similar to placebo treated uh, animal on day 21 post infection. And also, uh, like the parameters before, the letrozole treatment did not improve the lung function of the SARS-CoV-2 infected female at any uh, time point. Uh, we could, um, with our uh, letrozole treatment, we could improve the lung function of the hamster uh, at the uh, 21 post-infection. Just to sum up this part, we uh, so normally in hamster, or in male, we have an increased uh, testosterone level and, and, and low estrogen level. After the SARS-CoV-2 infection, we observe a drop in testosterone level and increased estrogen level in male hamster. Uh, um, after the treatment with the letrozole, we could partially uh, recover the, tes the, the testosterone level and also partially reduce the estrogen level.
Uh, furthermore, the male treated with letrozole uh, show improved lung function at day 21 post-infection with uh, reduced fibrosis in the lung. However, uh, the female do not really benefit from the letrozole treatment. Um, Taken together, these findings confirm that the CYP90A1 play an important role in the SARS-CoV-2 pathogenesis in, uh, in a male. Uh, like I say before, we always want to uh, translate our finding from animal models back to the, to the human cohort. And since we identify that an increased expression in the, in the enzyme tip 90 a one is associated with increased disease severity in male hamster, we want, of course, to assess if this changes um, in this expression in tip 19 uh, a one expression uh, could be also detectable in tissue from patients who die from COVID-19. Uh, therefore, we analyze autopsy material from the lung of men and women who were positive um, uh, for SARS-CoV-2 by qPCR and also die from uh, COVID-19 or at a free independent uh, study, site in, um, study site in Hamburg, Tübingen, and Rotterdam. And as a control, we analyze the lung material obtained for men and women who uh, never uh, who were never diagnosed positive for SARS-CoV-2 by qPCR. And here we can see that in all three uh, study sites, the CYP90A1 was abundantly expressed in the lung of COVID-19 male uh, patient compared to non-COVID-19 male uh, control at the time point of death. Mm. And this was also, uh, this was despite the fact that in COVID-19 male, like we see here, the free, uh, the free images, the white uh, background, um, the COVID-19 male, uh, SARS-CoV-2 uh, RNA was no longer detectable uh, at the time point of death in the male uh, COVID-19 patient. Uh, we confirmed this finding by uh, quantifying the mRNA expression level of CYP90A1 in the lung of the male uh, patient who died uh, of COVID-19. And we could also uh, show that the male shown increased CYP90A1 uh, expression in the lungs um, at the time point of death. However, it's important to say, due to the overall lower uh, female COVID-19 patient, also a uh, death case, the conclusive interpretation in female uh, is very, very limited here. Uh, now to some uh, the presentation app. We could show that SARS-CoV-2 infection leads to increased uh, inflammation in the lung of male with increased uh, fibrosis formation and also impair lung function. We could also show that the high virus titer correlated with low testosterone uh, and high estradiol uh, level in the male in the acute phase of infection. Um, all these data uh, together suggest that SARS-CoV-2 infection can induce several metabolic hits uh, <clears throat> in male hamster, and the first hits occur in the reproduct reproductive organs, and the second hit uh, in the lung, uh, res resulting in a massive sex hormone dysregulation in COVID-19 male. Uh, this may change the hypothalamic pituitary gonadal axis, the HPG axis, to the hypothalamic pituitary lung gonadal, gonadal axis. Uh, now I want uh, to thank uh, Professor Gabriel to give me the opportunity to work on this uh, great uh, project and to thank Dr. Schneider Bertram, Dr. Beck, and also Dr. Uh, uh, Schaumburg. Uh, they work, we work all together on this um, animal experiment and all the data that we showed uh, before, as of today. The whole group, our collaboration partner in the UKE, also in Tübingen and Rotterdam, and also the funding and you for your attention. Thank you. Excellent. Well, thank you, Nancy. Um, really great presentation, interesting stuff. And with that, I'll just bring Valeria and Nancy back on to the audio line. And uh, we'll kick things off with an interesting question here um, for 
Nancy, so uh, why did you choose to perform the experiment in these Syrian golden hamsters and not in mice? Can you provide maybe some pros and cons for this animal model? Oh, uh, yeah, of course. Uh, for example, Valeria show the humanized uh, mass model. They have pros and cons for uh, this model, but we use the SARS-CoV-2, uh, the hamster model for uh, several reasons. The first reason is the S2 receptor, because maybe most of you know, um, the SARS-CoV-2 uh, virus need the S2 uh, receptor in order to uh, get into the cells. And hamster uh, have the S2 uh, already on the cells, which mice didn't have. That's the first, the first um, important thing here, but also um, hamster have the ability to reflect the, the human data. For example, this is the age uh, bias or the sex difference that we see in, uh, in human cohort. We can also uh, apply it on hamster, for example, that uh, may are more uh, severely um, affect for SARS-CoV-2 or a other older hamster as also uh, affect for SARS-CoV-2, for example. Um, also, in hamster, we have able to study the, uh, the longitudinal um, approach, long long COVID, like uh, I would say, because we have the moderate uh, COVID-19 disease. We can, uh, the hamster can, they, they get ill, but after two weeks, they recover completely and we can then also uh, measure lung function, for example, or, the, or maybe all the brain related uh, dysregulation, for example, we can also sell it in, in the same animals. And also, of course, the whole um, that the we have the the hamster can uh, have the virus in the whole body. And this is really important to study, for example, drugs. And it's really similar, for example, uh, to human. This is just two free things that uh, make hamster the golden stand standard for uh, SARS-CoV-2 uh, study. Yeah, thanks. Great answer there. Um, all right, Valeria, this one will be for you. Uh, so thanks for the great presentation. This person says, can you share your experience with animal handling in the system restrainer and how is the acclimation process? Uh, yes, in the, um, basically in the tower, we uh, have a collar that is positioned between the base of the mouse skull and the shoulder in order to avoid thorax compression and maintain normal breathing since uh, different different nasal infection, these mice are not anesthetized. And uh, um, the, 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 their behavior inside the restrainer depends on uh, if the mouse is big or not, but uh, we have different dim dimension of the collar. But uh, we have noticed that if we um, if, if the mouse is bigger, it's better because, uh, uh, so for instance, the, the best, best size is a mouse around uh, 12 weeks of age uh, in order to maintain the pressure and uh, everything's fine inside the tower. And uh, about the acclimation process, uh, um, the mice are very quiet. They, they stay well, I think, uh, because uh, they think like uh, 10 minutes and then they do not move anymore. Uh, and the, the tower, we put the tower inside the hood because we are using the, uh, the, the SARS-CoV-2. And what I did is to switch off the light in order to, to acclimate better the, the mice. Fantastic. I hope yeah, to have answered answer your question. Yeah, great answer. Um, this is actually a nice follow-up question to that. So Nancy, you used uh, an indirect measurement and uh, used unrestrained animals. So um, I'm just trying to find where the question went. Uh, yeah, on unrestrained animals, can you uh, name you know some advantages of doing this as opposed to something more like what Valeria described? Oh, uh, yeah, yeah. Um, I mean, they have pros and cons, of course. Um, the first problem with a restraining hamster, they, they don't want it, they don't like it. And they are really stressed. Um, they're really, really stressed. They are not so, so. They are bigger than mice, but they're, they're also really, really stressed. And we tried to restrain a hamster. It didn't go so very well. 
then we say, we think, okay, maybe we have to think about other methods. I mean, it's possible to um, to measure lung function directly, the endpoint uh, measurement, uh, use tracheotomy, as a, you then, this is, we have to kill the, the hamster or the mice and then measure the lung function directly. But the problem with this method, of course, we can not measure the same animals from before the infection until 21 days, for example, after infection, like we did uh, in our study, for example. But um, we, yeah, we can consider to use other systems in order maybe to have the time point, for example, six day post infection, just to measure one, the one time point. But of course, we cannot measure because it what will be a lot of animals that we have to kill to have the same data, you know. Yeah. Okay. There are pros, of course, but also a control. Yeah. Yeah, certainly. Um, all right, here's an interesting question for Valeria. Did you get a chance to look at the survival rate of the HYAS2 mice? Does the infection actually resolve completely? Okay, yes. Uh, I arrived up to six day post infection, not more yet, uh, because it's a recently uh, generated model, but uh, mice survive whole, um, as also Katie and my two mice aerosolized. I have to say, but the thing is that the hybrid ACE2 have the expression of ACE2 that is 10, 10, 10 times less in the lung compared to K18 humans to mice. Indeed, the uh, infection and the viral titer and also the um, PFU that we measure in the lung, uh, three day post infection of these mice are fewer than the K18 humans to mice. So I think that. Uh, Yes, the, the, the infection resolved completely also because uh, seven day post infect, six day post infection, I already see antibody in the, in the plasma and not viral titer in the lung. And, but I have to say that it is a mild infection, milder compared to the K18 human is to mice. That I think that is resemble what happened to humans because the humans that are severe, experience a severe disease are the ones that have comorbidity. So the vast majority are asymptomatic. So I think that we are recapitulating that the kind of patient. Yeah, great point. Um, okay, here's a, a good question for Nancy Kwasi. So this attendee says, uh, Dr. Kwasi, thanks for the great presentation. Are you considering repeating this study with a different animal model? <laughs> yeah, this is a great question. <laughs> um, we we are thinking about it, uh, but, but but to be uh, to be honest, now at this stage, hamsters are the golden standard to study Zascov two. To be honest, but of course, uh, for example, to study um, transmissibility, for example, we can also use ferrets. For example, they are really really good models in order to to study or guinea pigs, for example. We, we can think about it, it's a nice question, but at this time point, uh, we didn't plan to do uh, the same study on, on different animals, but this is a good question. We, we also think about it, yeah. Yeah, perfect. Um, okay, here's an interesting one for Valeria. Uh, can you conclusively say that the transgenic ACE2 mice challenged with SARS-CoV-2 die from specifically the neurological infection and not something like pneumonia? I feel to answer yes, <laughs> uh, because uh, uh, we observed that uh, even even if we reduce the amount of virus uh, uh, with intranasal infection, we observed that like 30% of the mice died and have a, a, um, or were very sick, and the ones that are very sick have a huge uh, viral RNA in the brain. Uh, and also we try to uh, play with the uh, viral titer with upon hydrosol exposure. So we try to increase in that case, uh, but even if we increase uh, the viral load uh, um, of aerosol exposed mice, uh, we do not experience uh, uh, brain invasion, neither mortality. And moreover, we also perform uh, whole body platysmograph on both intranasal infected mice or aerosol exposed mice. And we observe that upon intranasal infection, five-day post-infection, we have that all parameters that we can uh, detect with the whole body platysmograph 
photograph are uh, affected, while upon uh, aerosol exposure only the RPF, that is uh, a marker of bronchoconstriction. So uh, since mice are very lethargic, I, th I think that all the parameters that we are reading with whole body practice marker in uh, internal infected mice are mainly due to brain infection rather than a lung pathology. Yeah, really good point. Um, okay, this next question has to do with uh, the sex differences in COVID-2 infection. Um, so Nancy, does letrozole work in uh, castrated hamsters, do you think? This is a very, really, really great question. We never checked, but I will just uh, by feeling say not really, because I mean, you, we need a substrate. We need testosterone in order to uh, convert to estradiol. And I mean, castrated hamsters are more likely like females, we'll say, although male castrated hamsters are like, like females. I think the literal treatment, we, I don't think so. I, I will say no. I will say no. But we don't, we, we don't check yet. But I will, I will say by feeling say no, because you don't have the testosterone at the beginning. Then we cannot see we cannot see the drop in the testosterone, for example, or the increase in estrogen because we don't have the substrate at the beginning. We don't have a testosterone at the beginning, and we cannot see this drop. And maybe we can all not not see uh, this regulation in the CYP nineteen A one in the lung, for example, or in the testes. I will see now. Right. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. Um, all right. This. Attendee has written, uh, Dear Dr. Fumagalli, thanks for the great presentation. Uh, may I ask, uh, what were, what was the, um, or how, how were you measuring the amount of virus that reached the lungs when administered via the inhalation tower? Um, and what kind of vehicle you used? Okay, starting from the second, uh, we use uh, uh, as a vehicle. We deal with depends on the initial stock concentration of the virus because we grow the virus in the MEM 0% on uh, Vero A6 or Vero Human Temper 2 cells. And if I have to dilute the uh, virus, I dilute it in uh, PBS. But based on that, uh, I also nebulize a control mouse with the same vehicle to then standardize all the uh, analysis that I will perform later. And about uh, how I measure the amount of virus that reach the lung, okay, this, this means the uh, deposited virus. Okay, I don't know. The only thing that I can, that can measure uh, is the viral RNA when I sacrifice the mouse. Uh, and indeed, I saw that the viral RNA is comparable between the two routes of infection because also with intranasal installation, I, I could not know which is the amount of virus that reached the lung, uh, starting from the one that I uh, infect, in, that I in, in, instilled in the mouse. So it's, it's the same problem. And also what, what I can control is the um, amount of virus that uh, is inhalated by uh, the mouse because I can calculate uh, how much virus I put inside the tower. But also in that case, we have to take in, in consideration that uh, not all the virus that I put inside the tower that is aerosolized reach uh, the, um, the, the lung of the mice because we have to consider also the exhalation of the, uh, of the mouse. So um, the only thing that I can say is to play with the dimension of the viral particles because if we um, increase uh, re reduce the humidity inside the tower we can reduce the size of the viral particles and so hope that these uh, aerosol smaller aerosol can go deep in the in the lung and not remain in the nasal turbine for instance but we could not uh, I, I could not say you which is the amount of virus deposited in the lung yeah, makes sense. Um, Blair, another question for you. We've got an, actually a few about the aerosolization process. Um, so can you speak at all to whether the aerosolization process reduces the infectivity of the SARS-CoV-2 virus or if it uh, destroys or damages the viral particle at all? Okay, this was one of my uh, fear at the beginning because I was not sure that the virus uh, stay alive uh, uh, upon uh, the aerosolization, but uh, uh, again, since uh, uh, giving the 
same uh, um, starting concentration between the children of infection and at the end I see uh, the same viral RNA in the lung, I can say that all the viruses that nebulize uh, stay alive, so remain vital. All right, very good. Um, okay, Nancy, so considering the uh, the whole body, or no, no, con uh, considering the whole body plethysmography pulmonary <laughs> system, um, which endpoint parameter do you think was the most important or telling? Do you think it was the, the lung resistance or compliance measured? Uh, and if not, do you feel it's needed? Oh, yeah, this is also a very great question. I mean, for, uh, for us, for example, during the, the, um, the infection with, with SARS-CoV-2, for example, in male, we could also per eye see uh, this increased breathing frequency, for example. It was really, really nice to see that what, uh, what we see per eyes, we could also confirm with the whole measurement. And we measure a lot of, uh, of hamster, male and female, and we could uh, confirm every, each experiment this measurement. I think for me, for the whole body, body, body plethysmography, I mean, the tidal volume, the frequency were really important, and also this um, EF15, the bi-tidal uh, flow, was also really important. On the other hand, uh, will be in the future or really nice to have, for example, the resistance in the compliance measure um, directly in the hamster. It's not possible to do it um, with the indirect um, method, but uh, we'd be great maybe to have a smaller experiment just with a few animals and uh, perform endpoint uh, measurement, for example, for resistance and compliance, for example. Uh, for example, the, um, the prior the infection, day six, for example, and maybe day 14 after infection. Will be nice to have, but uh, yeah, it's an animal application to, <laughs> to have also. But yeah, will be nice to have. But I mean, in our hand now, um, to have the, the the possibility to have this measurement because we have we, we measure a lot of uh, measurements i think we measure 12 parameters if i remember correctly and we are just uh, show a few of them and all the data uh, correlates together i mean the data are really uh, consistent uh, through the, the experiment but also through the animals it's uh, really convincing that we are uh, we are doing this well <laughs> Excellent. Yeah, that's really great to hear. Um, I think in the interest of time, we'll just have one last question here. Uh, so it's about uh, the use of these models for long COVID. Obviously, long COVID, uh, as we um, get deeper and deeper into it, has been a you know the subject of a lot of study. And we'll start with uh, Valeria. Do you think this animal model, the one that you've been using, uh, do you think it would be a, an appropriate model to study long COVID? Uh, yes. I think yes, because uh, mice stay alive for uh, uh, that did not die, and also we checked twenty day post infection where uh, of course uh, virus were uh, clearated from the lungs, so there uh, there was no trace of the vir viral RNA in uh, neither nasal turbine neither in the lung, but we were able to um, find specific CD8 and CD4 T cells uh, uh, as well as uh, the lung were very damaged. So we have uh, um, thrombi, uh, yarn deposition uh, that are uh, um, patterns that are similar to what observed in COVID-19 patient uh, in the lung of the patient. So I think that it could be a useful model to study also the uh, long-term consequences of the disease also because uh, a recent uh, result that I obtained is that I was able to spot inflammation in the spinal cord of these mice that were infected uh, with aerosol uh, uh, SARS-CoV-2 and this is interesting because the spinal cord then is, is uh, um, Colligated with the with, with the central nervous system, so maybe this can explain also uh, some headache and the problems in the central nervous system without having an infection that is observed also in uh, in patient. So I think yes. Excellent. Yeah, great answer. And uh, Nancy, handing things over to you, uh, and maybe research already has been done, but can you speak to uh, whether these golden hamsters would be a good model to study long COVID? Oh yes. Um, yeah. Of course. The answer is yes. Um, because as I mentioned before, the the hamster uh, can 
mimic the, the human data. It's great to have the sex bias, but also the age bias, but also the, um, the obese uh, bias, if I can say so. Um, then you can, with the hamster model, we can study the long-term effect on different uh, uh, model, male, female, uh, young, uh, uh, old. With, we can do a lot of things with uh, hamsters. It's really, really impressive. And we can study the, the immune system, the cytokines response. We can study lung function, longitudinally, as a, 40 day, 21, one month, two, three, one year, one, we can do pretty much anything because I mean the, the hamster, uh, we can have the hamster for three years, for example, in the lab. Then we can measure all these um, measurement prior to infection, 20 days after infection, but also one year or two years, I think, infection, or, or, or three years after infection. It's the great model, in my opinion, it's really, really great. And uh, we can do a lot of things. And I mean, the people out there uh, also realize uh, the hamster is the golden standard. And a lot of people are working uh, now on all these different high risk groups in hamster. Yeah, uh, my answer is different too. Yes. Fantastic. Well, for both these models, uh, I suppose that uh, then we'll certainly see in the coming you know, months and years, uh, more and more data coming out um, all the time. So I guess you know it's exciting to look forward to that. Um, but yeah, just to wrap things up, I mean, Nancy and Valeria, thanks so much for all the insights you've shared with us today. It's been a real pleasure having you with us. Thank you. You too. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. It was a pleasure. All right, excellent. Um, yeah, big thanks also, of course, to the audience here for participating. And last but not least, we'd also like to thank the sponsor, DSI and Harvard Bioscience. So in closing, we hope you enjoyed this Inside Scientific webinar, and we'll see you again next time. Have a great day, everyone. Thank you. Thank you.